My heart is tender this morning. I feel the tenderness and the and the and the power at the same time. I don't know how you can feel tender and power at the same time, but I've been ministered to this morning by the worship team and Vicky prophesied over me and while we were up here and I just feel the the sense of the Lord in this place. If we would for a moment, could we all stand to our feet? Let's just all stand up for a moment and um Take a deep breath. Lord, may the revelation of your word impact us, inspire us, and influence us. Impact us so that we might not be the same even if we walk away with a bruise or a broken hip. Lord, that you would inspire us to live differently, holy, other than set apart. And you would cause an influence to come upon us, influence, fluid, movement, like a river. That there would be the influence of your word upon us, that we might be the influence of the kingdom around us. So we just breathe you in, Lord. We ask for your presence to teach, for your word to correct, to rebuke, to encourage, and to train us in righteousness. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. All right, let's sit down. If you're taking notes, um, I'm going to be talking about our common enemy. And I'm going to be in a handful of scriptures that I'd love for you to go there with me. Our common enemy. And this is not the enemy that we have in common. As if what we have in common makes us strong or important. But the enemy whose name is common. Common is the enemy of holy. It's the opposite of holy. God is not common. He is holy. To be holy means to be set apart, to be other than, to be different. And to be common is to be ordinary, indifferent, and the same. So we should not be common. We should not be a common people. We're called to be holy, set apart, different, other than. So our common enemy today is about the enemy that is common, which is the, en the enemy of the holy. And one of our greatest temptations in the earth is not sin or evil or antichrist, but that we would take what is sacred and holy and treat it like it's common and ordinary and become indifferent to truth. That's the temptation. This is why we have such a battle for truth in our society, in our culture. There's an attempt to make truth not what God's word says truth is. And then it, there's an attempt to make common or make ordinary that Jesus doesn't say anything about homosexuality or the Bible doesn't say anything about transgenderism or the Bible isn't clear about abortion or euthanasia, but it is. And both the scriptures and ancient Hebrew texts and the early apostolic fathers and the Bible 
has plenty to say about the issues of truth. And we need to let the truth of God reign in our hearts. And the truth of God is holy. God is holy. So we must escape from the common. And I don't just, I'm not talking about common sense or, you know, things like that. I think you guys understand what I'm getting to here. Are you with me? The enemy of the holiness of God is the common. And taking something that's sacred and treating it like it's ordinary. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to take what's holy. What God, I don't want to take what God does in this place and treat it like it's ordinary. And we always have a temptation to do that because we're here week after week after week. The team is here rehearsing and going through songs. I don't want the songs we sing to become common. And now, no, there's a tension between... We want the voice of the Lord to be familiar, but we don't want to treat it like it's familiar. Right? You've heard the statement, familiarity breeds contempt. And we want his voice to be familiar so that we understand it, but we don't want to treat it like it's familiar, like it's ordinary, like it's common. It's beautiful every time he speaks. It's beautiful every time he instructs. It's painful sometimes when he instructs. And I don't want to write it off as ordinary. I want to give you some examples from Scripture. The first one I want to give you um, is out of Genesis. I'll read out of it, Genesis chapter 3, if you're there, or if you want to write it down. The first thing I want to tell you about not treating something common is don't treat the word of the Lord as common. In Genesis, we have man and woman in the garden and they're given responsibility. And it says in chapter three, now the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the certain serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the midst of the garden for you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, it was attractive. It was sexy. It was something that she was drawn to and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it, and she also gave to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. I think the first sin in the scriptures is not disobeying God, but disbelieving God. Because God said to them, I made you in my image. God already made them like him. And so the serpent said, don't you know that you will be like God? And they should have known that they were already like God in his image. So perhaps the first sin is not disobeying, but disbelieving what the Lord said. And disbelieving leads to disobedience, which is false worship. They took what was holy, the word of God, and they boiled it down to something common. It lost its sacredness. And in doing that, the voice of the serpent became, I don't know, understandable, made sense that this is what I should do. And so don't treat the word of the Lord as common. And like I said, there's a tension between the, the we want the voice of the Lord to be familiar because we want to recognize it, but we don't want to treat it 
as if it's something ordinary. It's extraordinary. The point here is that we're wired to believe. God designed us to believe in something. God designed us to worship. And it was natural in the beginning for man to worship in the garden, to worship the Lord. And then after the fall, it was still natural for man to worship. We just ended up worshiping other things and disbelieving God and disobeying God. So when we don't believe what he said about us, we will believe another. So what does God say about us? It's probably the most important thing that'll keep us in him. What does God say? I'll give another example of that shortly. What does God say about us? But I want to go to number two. Don't treat your worship as common or ordinary or unimportant. If you fast forward just one chapter to Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, we read about what I have understood to be the first example of worship in the scriptures where Cain and Abel both offer an, uh, an offering to the Lord. They bring God an offering. And it says in verse 3, it says, In the course of time of Genesis chapter 4, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel brought an offering, fat portions, and some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor upon Abel in his offering, but on Cain his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. There's, there's another ancient um, Hebrew text that talks about Cain and Abel that goes something like this. It was at the expiration of a few years that they brought a comparable offering to the Lord. And Cain brought from the fruit of the ground and Abel brought from the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And God turned and inclined to Abel in his offering and a fire came down from the Lord from heaven and consumed it. And to Cain and his offering, the Lord did not turn and he did not incline it for he had brought from the inferior fruit of the ground before the Lord. And Cain was jealous against his brother Abel on account of this. And he sought a pretext to slay him. Cain brings what's convenient. Abel brings out of conviction. And I'm telling you to not treat our worship as common, as in don't treat what we bring to the Lord. Don't bring him what's easy or what's convenient or what works for you. Bring what he requires. Abel brings an uncommon sacrificial true worship to the Lord. And Cain brings a convenient common, easy, false worship. And I, I, I've preached out of this Cain and Abel text a lot and, and give little snippets of it from time to time because we can learn so much about worship by looking at the account of Cain and Abel. We, one of the most important things we can learn is that you can worship the one true living God and he not accept your offering. That's dangerous. We think of false worship as idolatry, worshiping something else, worshiping another God, putting something before the Lord. But here we're learning that you can give something to the Lord and he not accept it because it was easy or it was convenient. So let's not treat our worship like it's ordinary. Your worship is a weapon for your life. We wage war with our worship. We, we contend with our worship. We proclaim the truth of God with our worship, and we should not treat that as common. We should treat it as a holy thing. And I think this out of uh, the story of Cain and Abel, when our hearts aren't amazed by his holiness, we will bring inferior worship when we're not amazed by the beauty of God, 
we will bring an inferior offering like Cain did. I believe that Abel had a revelation of God, a revelation of even the blood. Because he brought a blood sacrifice. He brought the best. You guys know this. I say this. Abel brought the first of his flock. He brought the fat portions. Abel brings God the bacon. Abel knows what God wants. And so he's like, I'm going to give you the best. Cain just brought what he could. He brought an inferior fruit. I believe Abel had a revelation of God that caused him to go, wow, the beauty, the awe, the glory, the holy, the sacred of God deserves my best. Cain did not have a revelation, which also should teach us to be careful to not bring worship without revelation. You can't have worship without revelation. Because in order to worship God rightly, you must first see him. Abel saw God and he got a revelation. Whether it was a revelation of the blood or not, he brought his best. I don't think Cain had a revelation of God. I think Cain just went through the motions. He did what we might call religious worship. Just did it because he thought he was supposed to do it. Well, this is what we do on Sunday morning. So here I am. Here I am, Lord. Just come as you are. Isn't that the message of the church? Come as you are. So I came as I am. I'm just tired and just bringing you whatever I can. And the Lord's like, I do not accept that. Where's your best for the Lord? And it's, and it's not, it's not, it's our, the worship that we bring God that he doesn't accept is not because he doesn't like us. And it's not because we don't like him. It's because we're not seeing him properly because we've taken what's sacred and we've made it common. We've made it ordinary. So this is why we have to be careful to not see God as ordinary or common. Because when you see him as sacred, you bring a sacrifice that costs you. So I'll say that again, when our hearts are amazed by his holiness, we will, when our hearts are not amazed by his holiness, we'll bring an inferior offering, which means when our hearts are amazed by him, we will bring the right worship, the right offering. I may be getting ahead of myself, but I kind of, and I may use this example again later on, but I think of, no, I'm going to get to it later. That's what I'm going to do. Let me give you a third example. Let's move to. Point number three, I guess, if it's a good message. Don't, so I said, don't treat the word of God as common. Don't treat your worship as common. Do not treat the presence of God as common. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we have the account of the Ark of the Covenant being transported from Abinadab's home to Jerusalem. And on the way, Uzzah touches the ark, the presence of the Lord, and dies. This is the account that we're going to read from. Second Samuel chapter 6, starting in verse 3, it says, They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Jerusalem were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. So the ark of the Lord is coming. Let's take a pause. The ark of the Lord is coming into Jerusalem where they're on their way. I think it's, it's um, I did some research and it's like 10 miles or something they have to take the Ark of the Covenant, and they're celebrating and worshiping along the way. They're doing what they think is right, right? They're worshiping the Lord, all the minstrels and the instruments are going up. 
And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. And therefore God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. And then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. So here we have the account. It's a little bit bizarre because it's like, okay, here's Uzzah. He's a Levite and he tries to save the Ark of the Covenant from falling. And he dies. That's kind of rough. And David was mad at God. You ever been mad at God? He was like, what in the world? You are, you're all, you're messed up. Why'd you kill that guy? He was a Levite. He was a worshiper. And he was the son of the guy whose house we just got the ark from. What am I supposed to say? Right? David's all kind of frustrated. But the problem with the transportation of the ark is that they valued the they valued the presence of God, but they didn't value the instruction of God because the Lord instructed that the ark be transported on the shoulders of the Levites. And they instead built a cart for the oxen to carry the ark. I don't know why. We don't know why. It's one of those things. Well, maybe we'll discover in eternity. But m- maybe David was like, let's give the Levites a break. Let's let them walk. Keep an eye on the ark. Let's let these oxen carry this thing because it's heavy. But you know that the grace of God is on the instruction of God. The power of God is on the instruction of God. And when you follow the instruction of God properly, if they were to put that ark on the Levites, like they were told, the strength and grace would have been on them to carry it properly. But because David did not obey the instruction of the Lord, the presence of God ended up making Uzzah die. And I know the point of this is valuing the presence of God. I really do think when I read this scripture that they valued the presence, but they didn't value the instruction. And so how can we truly value the presence of God without valuing his instruction? They celebrated, they danced, they had the timbrels and what was it? All the, all the, the harps and the lyres and the castanets and all the instruments and the cymbals. They were worshiping because the presence of God was on the move, but they did not listen to the instruction of God. How often can we be loving the presence of God, but living in and leading in such a way where we're not according to his instructions. We have to be careful about that. If you truly value the presence of God, then we'll value the instruction of God as well to carry his presence. And a a note there about the presence of God is that it was always meant to rest on men. God, God's design for his presence and for his, for him was to be with man. God's ultimate desire is to be with man. And so when he gives David instructions to how to carry the ark, he says, put the ark of the covenant on the worshipers, put it on the Levite's shoulders because God desires for his presence to be on man. And then we see that in the new covenant where The temple was always the place of worship. The tabernacle was the place of worship. Eden was a sanctuary, a place where God dwelled with his people. And the tent of meeting was that with Moses and the tabernacle and the temple and all of that. And then in the new covenant, where's the temple? It's us. We're the temple of the living God. How are we honoring the presence of God on our life? And following his instruction and not treating his instruction like it's common, our common enemy.
when we don't follow the leading of the presence with his instruction, we will fail in carrying his presence. There's some good news in response to the rough story of Uzzah. In 1 Chronicles 15, it says, David now built several buildings for himself in the city of David, David, but he also prepared a place for the ark of God and set up a special tent for it. And he commanded, no one except the Levites may carry the ark of God. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to serve him forever. And then David summoned all of Israel in Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. See, the beauty of David is that he didn't always get it right. But we do see a track record of him repenting and course correcting. That's what God loves. So even if we have been abusive or treated the spirit as common or the presence of God as common and not made his instruction important. The heart of David that turns and says, I'm going to course correct. God values that. So David builds a tabernacle and he goes, guys, we're not going to get this presence thing wrong again. We're not going to get the Ark of the Covenant wrong. We're going to put it in a special place and do not touch it. Only the Levites. It goes on their shoulders. I promise you, no one was carrying the Ark of the Covenant wrong after that. So if I could give a couple of applications to this. Sacred strategies are not common. The the way that God will give you a strategy or um, give you his word is not going to be very common. Because the way of the kingdom is upside down. It's different than the ways of our world, isn't it? God does things differently than he does in the natural. And so we have to be careful that what, when we think something makes sense, it's not always God. I like what Ray Hughes says. He says, God is big, but big ain't always God. A lot of times God doesn't make sense when he tells us to do stuff. Anybody testify to that? (laughs) Honor the word, his presence and worship rightly, and he will be your protector, vindicator and portion. So think of Moses. Didn't Moses make a place to host the presence of God? He met with God on the mountain, but he had the tent of meeting where he met with God. And Joshua desired to be in the tent of meeting. Joshua loved the tent of meeting. He was like, put me with the Lord. I want to be with the Lord. And because Moses knew that God wanted to be with his people, he made a spot to meet with God in the midst of his people. And the blueprint or the concept of the tent of meeting got caught by David and he established a tabernacle and then ultimately a temple. Because these guys knew, the prophets knew, Moses, David, Solomon. These guys knew that God wanted a resting place in the earth with men. And so because of that, God followed the Hebrew people around in the wilderness with a cloud by day and a fire by night. The provision, protection, and portion of the Lord will follow true honoring of the sacred when we honor the sacred and don't treat it as common the provision of God is there the protection of God is there so think about David in the tabernacle and God's sacred strategy to be with his people David built this tabernacle it's so intricate I think there's like 50 chapters in the Bible that talk about how it's supposed to be put together and all of the um you know the elements and everything that represented you know an ass actually it all Every aspect points to Jesus. So the altar where you bring your sacrifice points to Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. The wash basin, the bronze basin for the cleansing of the priests when they went in there. Jesus is 
the waters of life. He's the river of life, right? He, Jesus represents, he fulfills the temple. In that bowl of incense, Jesus becomes the intercessor sitting at the right hand of the Father. Jesus was an intercessor when he was here. I know my intercessors love that, right? Jesus was interceding when he was here, and he sits interceding at the right hand of the Father. He fulfills the temple. He is the veil that was torn. He fulfilled the temple. So David constructs the temple, honors the law of God, the word of God, and honors right worship. So he gets this instruction from God and follows God. Did you guys know for 33 years, David tent, the tabernacle of David had 24 seven worship going on for 33 years. And during that 33 years, not one invader, not one battle was fought because the protection of the Lord was over the nation. 24 seven worship in the tabernacle for 33 years. That's a type and shadow, isn't it? It's the type and shadow of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the temple. So he was here for 33 years offering 24 seven obedience and worship to the Lord. No invader during those years, no battles fought. Israel was in right standing with God because of worship, because of honoring the holy and the sacred. They prioritized the presence of God and they did it correctly. I think that we can prioritize the presence of God and still not do it correctly. That's what we can learn about the transportation of the ark from Abinadab's to Jerusalem. And then they just, they put the ark in Obed-Edom's house for like three months. They were like, let's just take a step back here, guys. Can you imagine Obed-Edom? <laughs> David's knocking on your door like, hey, we got to put this ark. Okay, what, what, yeah, what's going on? Well, somebody touched it and they died, but we got to put it somewhere. <laughs> and Obed-Edom's like, Okay, kids, don't touch the ark. <laughs> but it was in Obed-Edom's house, and he honored it, and he honored the presence of God. And then the presence came into the city, and that's where David danced until his clothes came off. You guys remember? Um, how about another application of this, or how about a story from Scripture that teaches us about uncommon strategies of God. Cause what I'm trying to show you is that the sacred strategies are uncommon strategies. And so what is this? The strategy for protection over a nation is 33 years of nonstop praise and worship. Okay. That doesn't make sense. You don't want us to build a bigger wall. You don't want us to finish the wall from border to border. You don't want us to get a bigger army. No, you want us to worship in the tabernacle for 33 years, 24 seven. That's how God wants to protect his people. Come on, somebody. How about Jehoshaphat's army? We know this one, right? You guys know, I love this story. So Judah is uh, against well, the Moabites, the Ammonites and the Mayanites are against Judah. So there's armies of regions coming against Judah and Jehoshaphat is the king. And basically someone, a messenger comes to Jehoshaphat and says, Hey, listen, you guys are toast. There's all these armies are coming against you and they're coming from Edom, which is not good. And so then it says the spirit of the Lord came over Jehaziel. This is in second Chronicles 20. So second Chronicles 20 for your reference. And in verse 14, it says, the spirit of the Lord came over Jehaziel and Jehaziel is a Levite. Oh man, these are good. We got a bunch of Levite examples here. Worship is important, isn't it? And Jehaziel said, King Jehoshaphat, listen, all you who live in Judah and Jerusalem, listen, the Lord says to you, do not be afraid. Do not lose hope because this huge army. The battle is not yours. It's God's tomorrow. March down against them and you will not have to fight this battle. Take your positions. Stand firm. You will see how the Lord will save you. 
Judah and Jerusalem, don't be afraid. Don't lose hope. Go and face them tomorrow. The Lord will be with you. Now, notice the spirit of the Lord came over Jehaziel and he prophesied to Jehoshaphat, but did not say at all to go worship in the battlefield. I don't know if you ever noticed that, but the prophet that came to tell Jehoshaphat that the battle belonged to the Lord and that he wasn't going to have to fight the battle, he did not say to go take your singers down there. He did not say take your musicians down there and have a worship service. He didn't say that. He just said, go down to the battle. And I skipped over a few. I went for verse 14, 15. I guess I did 16 and 17. But he does say to go down to a specific place. And how how about this kind of instructions? Sacred strategies, people. Tomorrow, march down against them. Take your positions. Stand firm. You will see how the Lord will save you. That reminds me of God calling Abraham, saying, go to a place that I will show you. Okay, God, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. Just go. And it's like Jehaziel is telling Jehoshaphat and the nation saying, take your positions, go down there, and then see how the Lord will save you. He doesn't tell them to go sing. I think I know why they sang. Are you ready? Because y'all know I look into this stuff. Anything that's got to do with worship. I believe the reason that Jehoshaphat's army sang in the battle and worshiped the Lord, it wasn't because it was in the instruction of God, because the instruction of the Lord was to just go down to the battle and wait and watch the Lord deliver them. I think it's because they realized who they were. Because the name Judah means praise. In Judah, Jehoshaphat was king over Judah, which was the southern kingdom. And Judah comes from the Hebrew word, it's our transliteration of yada. And yada is to wave your hands. Can you guys yada for me? There, that's those yod is your hand. Nice yods. That's what I tell my students. Nice yods. Let me see your yods. Yada. Yeah, you wave the hand. That is, you know, David in Psalm 141, he says, Lord, may the lifting of my hands, the yada, be like the evening sacrifice. So this is a form of worship, a form of praise to lift the hands and wave them to the Lord. This is why we do this in worship. Yada. It's one of the Hebrew words for praise. And Judah comes from Yada. And so Judah, the nation, said, well, we're supposed to go down to the battle. And they said we're supposed to stand down there and not fight. What are we supposed to do? Everyone's going to pee their pants. What should we do? Well, who are we? We're Judah. Yeah. Yeah. What's that mean? Well, that means praise. Let's, let, let's go down there and be who we are. Let's go down there and praise the Lord because that's what Judah is and that's what Judah does and that's what we will do. So they went down to the battle and they praised the Lord. They did what God called their name to be. And they, they manifested who they were and they worshiped. Isn't that good? Uncommon strategies. Sacred strategies. So, I'll wrap this up. I, wanna, I want us to ask the Lord, what is it, God, that I've treated as common that you desire to remain in me as sacred and holy. What have I missed? What have I, what have I become too familiar with that all of a sudden I've treated it as ordinary and common? Carissa, would you and the team come on up? 
And we'll just minister to the Lord because I feel the best response to this, everyone, is to just get in the presence of God, hear from him and realign ourselves. I'm talking about like realign. What is it that we've treated as common? Real, maybe our mind, our body, the temple, you know, your body is the temple of the living God. Your body is a holy, sacred space for the living God to abide. So let's ask ourselves, Lord, is the temple that is my body being treated as commonplace? Is the place where you dwell honoring the sacred that you are? Is how I, how I treat my body, is it a holy thing? Or have I just gotten common and just been like, well, that's the physical and God cares about the spiritual. Have I lost the sacred of my temple, of your temple? What about our minds? The temple that is my mind How have I treated your word, your presence, and your heart in my mind? Have I renewed my mind today? It says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Lord, do I have thoughts within me, patterns, thinking patterns within me that are not according, that have just become common? That where I've treated the holy as common in my mind. Lord, renew my mind. Transform me by the renewing of my mind. Spirit of God. What about your church, O Lord? Have we treated the holy thing that is your church, of which Christ is the cornerstone? Have we neglected the holy within the church? Has it just become common for us to walk in here, to gather together? Lord, you said in your word, don't neglect meeting together. Have we forgotten the power of agreement? Have we forgotten... Have we treated getting together as common, as ordinary? Have we not valued the holiness of it? Lord, you said where two or three are gathered. Here you are in the midst of us. Have, have we treated that as common? What a holy thing that you decide to be with us. You decide. Now you said, if there's two or three of you, ask anything in my name. Lord, if we treated that word as common. Have we treated the cultivating of your spirit in us to produce the fruit of the spirit? Have we treated as common? We sing the songs to our kids of the fruit of the spirit, but do we bear them, Lord? We know the fruit of the Spirit. There's nine of them. We can name them. We can sing them. We've memorized them. But are we? do we treat them as ordinary? Oh, that you would break us today, Lord, of our common patterns, the enemy that is common. And that you would put within us a value and a priority for the sacred, for the word of God, for the truth of God. What about your table, Jesus? Have we treated your body and blood as common? holy 
holy transforming power of communion the remembrance of your sacrifice have we just been ordinary with it we set it out we have open communion here but it's not common it's not ordinary it's open but it's not we're not indifferent to it you're welcome to to it but it's holy it's sacred Lord, bring us back to a place of holy surrender. Let us not treat the songs we sing like they're just words. Lord, strengthen our spirit. I hear the Lord say, Strengthen your spirit by killing your flesh. You'll value what's sacred and what's holy the more you kill the flesh. The more you are denying the patterns of the flesh, your spirit will become strong and value what I value, says the Lord. I believe there's sacred strategies in the room that the Lord is calling us to that are uncommon, that are different. Lord, what are you calling us to? Not treat as common the table. Let's just stand to our feet for a few minutes and tell the Lord that we put him in his rightful place. That your holiness, Lord, we look at and reprioritize in our life.
set apart for you, my master. I am ready to do your will. Yeah, Lord, come purify our hearts. I want you to value the word. I want you to value the worship that's going to come forth when you see me rightly. Lord, what do we need to get out of our vision so that we can see you rightly? Lord, what do we need to set aside? What do we need to turn off and stop the listening to, Lord, so that we can hear you rightly, Lord? Open our eyes so that we can see you. Open our ears that we can hear you, Lord. Open our hearts so we might know you. Lord, we want to see you. Give us a revelation of your word. Be our vision, Lord. Be thou my vision. I want to see you clearly, Jesus. We look at the Lamb and we say, you are holy. You're in your rightful place. I set aside distractions, Lord. And if you can, if you hear what those are, the Lord's revealing it to you, just write those down. Just write them down and tell someone. Say, the Lord's telling me to get this out of my life. I need to take this subscription off of what I'm paying for. I need to set this aside. I need to, I need to do this with my day. Just begin to write those things down. Write them down so that you can be reminded. The Lord is realigning us today. Realign us to the holy. Realign us to the sacred, Lord. We want to be holy as you are holy. We want to be set apart, different. I don't want to be indifferent about the presence of God. I don't want to be indifferent about worship. I don't want to be indifferent about your truth.
We declare the protection of God over your people with sacred strategies, just like you protected Israel, just like you protected Judah during 33 years of nonstop worship and praise. Lord, we pray the protection of your people. We pray sacred strategies come to them for protection and provision, just like Jehoshaphat's army, Lord. Uncommon sacred strategies that cause the protection of the Lord to come upon us. And don't you know that when Jehoshaphat's army went down to battle and they sang and they worshiped the Lord, that the enemy was confused, that the enemy actually turned on themselves and killed one another. Lord, I pray that you would deceive the enemy, that you would, that you would cause the enemy confusion in the camp of the enemy because of the uncommon in us. Lord, confusion in the camp of the enemy because of the sacred strategy in our life. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master. We are ready to do your will, oh Lord, we are ready to do giving up and yielding and sacrificing and surrendering our will and yielding it to him. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for sharing your heart, which is God's heart. Thank you for that. Psalm 121 over you as a benediction today. I look up to the mountains and the hills longing for God's help. And then I realize that our true help and our protection comes only from the Lord, our creator who made the heaven and the earth. He will guard and guide me never letting me stumble or fall. God is my keeper. He'll never forget nor ignore me. 
He will never slumber nor sleep. He is the guardian God for his people, Israel. Jehovah himself will watch over you. He's always at your side to shelter you safely in his presence. He's protecting you from all danger both day and night. He'll keep you from every form of evil or calamity as he continually watches over you. You will be guarded by God himself. You'll be safe when you leave your home and safely you will return. He will protect you now and he'll protect you forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. Well, you are dismissed. Go in the presence of the Lord. Touch every life that comes into your way with his touch, with his glory. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>